Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. I now can't see any of you, which is slightly disconcerting, but um, I will assume that everything is working fine. Um, so thank you, Joel, for that introduction, and thank you to everyone for, for joining in on the session today. Um, I'm Vicky de Blasi. I'm the founder of Innovate Comms. Um, we're an organization that specialize in marketing and PR for um, innovation projects and technology uh, test beds and trials. Um, and as part of that, I do an awful lot of work for Cisco with their innovation activities in the UK and Ireland. Um, and in probably the only um, uh, presentation that you'll hear over the course of this event um, that is going to be talking to you about cows. Um, there is a reason for this. Um, I promise you it's not entirely random. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about today is a purpose-built app that we created um, about this time last year actually called Me and Moo, uh, which we defined, created and launched in 12 weeks. Um, and the idea of the app was essentially to connect users with a real life cow that was connected to the internet um, whilst living on a very nice farm in Somerset. Um, and what Joel has asked me to do today is just to talk to you, to tell you a little bit about um, why on earth we decided to do this slightly crazy thing, how it fitted into um, the work that we do around projects, um, and some of the kind of key learnings and I suppose best practices that came out of that campaign. So, to provide a little bit of context, um, the reason that we created this app is um, at that time I was working for Cisco as the communications director for um, a project called 5G Rural First. Um, this was a project made up of a consortium of 30 different partners which Cisco was leading uh, and part funded by the government. So the project was part of the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sports, 5G Testbed and Trials Programme. And as the name suggests, uh, the project was focused on, um, on um, solving the rural connectivity challenge and looking at how 5G could potentially be deployed beyond the city to, to everyone. So to um, the whole of the, the, the country and the rural areas that exist uh, within the UK and Ireland. As part of that, we were running test beds and trials in three locations, uh, the Orkney Islands, Somerset and Shropshire. And th I mean, there was a whole host of challenges associated with this project, not, not least the fact that we had 30 partners to try and kind of corral and coordinate. But there were kind of two key comms challenges that really um, led to the ultimate decision to, to develop the Mia Moo app. The first was that one of DCMS's key sort of objectives to the program as a whole was to try and raise awareness um, of 5G amongst the general population um, and to start to educate them or to change the perception that 5G is basically the same as 4G, but a bit quicker. So it was how do we get kind of Joe blogs on the street to, to actually be interested and kind of care about 5G. The second thing that was specific to our project is that if you speak to anybody that lives in a, in a rural area, rural connectivity is a really hot topic. Those people care passionately about that. If, however, you live in a town or a city, you probably don't care about rural connectivity at all. Um, and it's quite likely that your general perception of this is that if you've chosen to live somewhere as beautiful and remote as the Orkney Islands, there's lots of benefits of that, but one of the trade-offs is you probably can't make a phone call. So the real challenge that we had was how, how do we raise awareness of this project and how do we get everybody to care about it? How do we get across the fact that this is an issue that the whole of the UK should be, should be focused on? And the project itself had really ambitious goals. So one of the things that um, the partners wanted to do was to change policy. They wanted to influence uh, the telecom regulator, Ofcom, to make fundamental changes to the way that Spectrum was issued and shared for 5G, which would really potentially open up um, connectivity to rural areas in the way it hadn't been before. So we spent a long time looking at the use cases and it won't um, surprise probably all of you to learn that actually the majority of people working in this project were very very technical lots and lots of engineers um, as a marketeer I was a bit of a, um, a, a, a rarity an oddity you might say um, definitely not very many of my type in this in this uh, consortium of 30 partners 
And a lot of the projects, um, aspects and use cases were very, very technical, very dry, really required quite a lot of technical understanding to, to get your head around them. And what we wanted to do is, from a comms perspective, identify something that we could hang our hat on. Um, recognizing that actually some of those more technical um, and involved discussions um, and topics were really important and when it came to things like spectrum sharing it was important that we got to the, the detail of that but that actually leading with that as a comms message was likely to mean that we just rattled around in the echo chamber. We'd be talking a lot to people who were interested in tech and interested in 5G but probably not many other people. Reviewing the use cases, however, one of them really struck, stuck out. Um, and the Somerset testbed was focused on a dairy farm down there. And one of the things that we were doing is deploying connected collars to each of these 100 cows that lived on the farm. These collars are basically like Fitbits for cows. Um, they're very lightweight, they're comfortable, and they enable the, the farmer to access in real time data about the cows, how much they are sleeping, how much they are resting, how much they are moving around, how many times a day they are milking, how much milk they're producing, um, all of which was designed to do two things. Firstly, it was enabling the uh, farmer to get early indicators that some of the cows might be unwell. So in a normal farm, essentially, the farmer is reliant on visual cues. They see that the cow appears to be unwell, and at that point, they might call a vet in. At that point, it might be that the cow is quite seriously ill. So the idea was that providing early indicators um, through data and looking at things like how much they were resting, how much they were sleeping, could give the farmers far better warning that the cow might be unwell and to um, allow earlier intervention. The second benefit of this is that happy cows produce more milk. So not only are you looking after the welfare of the cow, but by doing that, you're also hopefully uh, optimising milk production and ultimately the profitability of the farm. So this was the one that we kind of thought, yes, there is something in this. Everybody likes a cow, don't they? So we really felt that this was the one that we could go to town with. And so from a creative perspective, we thought about, OK, how do we really grab people's attention with this? You know, pr practically, the farm is in Somerset. The farm is a working farm. We cannot bring hordes of people down to see these to see these cows. That will definitely upset the farmer and probably upset the cows. What we wanted to do is to find a way to bring the cows and the story of these cows to the general public. And so we decided to develop an app. Um, it's me and Moo, as you can see on the screen there. Um, and the idea was that it connected people with a real life cow. We didn't necessarily hold out much expectation that, um, you know, hundreds and thousands of people were going to use this app. It wasn't really what we were thinking about here. What we wanted to do is to create really a kind of a moment in time that could grab people's attention, hopefully secure lots of headlines, and actually use that as really a kind of foot in the door, a tactic to grab the mainstream audience attention. And then that could open up the door to say, well, actually, this is part of a bigger project with you know, more serious issues. And then we can get into some of the more detailed technical discussions and uh, policy changes that we were hoping to influence. So what did the cow, what did the cow app do? Well, um, users could choose from 100 cows and they had the ability to connect with that for a seven day period. You can see here just a selection of, of, of some of our girls um, and each cow had a little profile as you can see there. So very much in the kind of Tinder for cow territory here. Um, we named each of our cows. Uh, sadly, in real life, the cows are just um, uh, named uh, by a number. They don't have an actual name. So we spent a lot of time and discovered that um, Nan's names are really good names for cows. So we named all of our cows. We wrote profiles for each of our cows and created a little profile on them based on um, their breed, their activity they were doing at that time, their birthday and their age. People could connect with that cow for a seven day period. And they were then provided with not quite real time, but uh, real world data um, around the cows themselves. They could see how much milk they produced that. Well, actually, they couldn't see how much produce they produced that day um, because we had to protect that for confidentiality and commercial reasons. But we tracked it in terms of kind of a small, medium, large milk output. 
um, we tracked in terms of how much, many hours they've been sleeping, how many hours they've been resting, and how much they've been walking around that day. And we really committed into this. So, um, you know, we could have just gone very basic with this, turned something out quite quickly, uh, but we didn't want to do that. We really wanted to commit to this fully. Um, and one of the things that I passionately believe with my job, and Joel will have heard me say this before, that you know, my role is to uh, communicate innovation. And as a result, I really believe that to do that, you have to be innovative in terms of how you're communicating. So we really went all in for this um, at every single level. So our cows, for example, we could have just used standard stock imagery. We did not do that. Um, I had a very interesting conversation where I convinced Duncan, our farmer, to take um, headshots of all 100 of the cows. Um, he absolutely thought I was insane, but he did do it. Um, and we got some fantastic shots that really, you know, even some sort of over the shoulder, sultry uh, cow headshots that, that would have uh, rivaled the best Tinder profiles you've seen. We also um, went full in in terms of the experience of people within the app itself. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, there were actually quite a lot of um, restrictions about how much of the data we actually could share. So, from a because it's a working farm, we couldn't provide um, specific details around um, the milk outputs. So, we wanted to make sure that we had a kind of a full experience. So, we thought a lot about the user usability and the in-app experience. So, once you created your or connected with your cow, sorry. Uh, you then had the ability to form a herd. So you could invite other people to, um, to download the app, connect with their cow, and join your particular herd. Um, you could name your herd, and we had a lot of um, suggested names in there. We went full on on the, on the puns for this one. The more cow puns than you could shake a stick at. Um, and then we had a, a game, we included a gamification element. So we had a leaderboard and um, each herd was allocated points based on um, the cow behavior. So um, we allocated points and gave people badges depending on things like whether it, when it was your cow's birthday, if your cow had walked the most number of steps that day, if your cow had had the greatest milk output of all the other cows that day but also points based on the user's um, interaction with the app. So if they would sent messages, if they would checked in on their um, cow, if they had invited people to join the herd and created a leaderboard around that. Um, and we saw huge levels of um, competitiveness from uh, individuals that DCMS set up their own cow, uh, multiple herds and were having huge levels of competition there. People really got into that. Um, and we also included um, functionality to send people in your herd uh, messages. Again, we had pre-populated suggestions of lots of kind of cow pun related gags. Um, and my personal favorite element, a whole set of emojis. So these were emojis that were specific to cows. So we had, you know, milk churns, we had cowbells, we had, you know, little scenes of grass. Uh, but we also created cow versions of some of our own favorite emojis. So my personal favorite was probably the uh, cow dancing in the red flamenco dress. Um, and people could share these again with other people within their herd. So we really committed to it. We thought long and hard about how to do that. And I think one of the things that we really did here was actually kind of borrow from our, I suppose, our B2C cousins here. Um, you know, we had a lot of fun with this and we gave ourselves full permission to have fun with this. We weren't taking ourselves overly seriously here. We weren't thinking about, you know, how do we include huge amounts of, of tech jargon and speak in there? We wanted to make it as, um, as, broad brush and as appealing to as broad and mass market audience as possible. Um, and we allowed ourselves to permission to, to be a bit tongue in cheek with it. But because, of course, we're a B2B, so we're far more serious than our B2C cousins. Uh, we also made sure we had a healthy dose of rigor in there. So um, we wanted to make sure that we, of course, did bring in some 5G messaging in there. And one of the things we did, and you can see actually on screen, that is Duncan the farmer. By this point, he'd gotten fully into this. Um, and we went down to the farm and we filmed a whole series of videos with him, which were, um, we had Moo TV in, in the app and uh, we had all of these videos in the app. 
Um, and these highlighted a couple of things. They showed people the collars. Um, they showed the cows and the environment that they lived in. And they explained how the technology that was in there from robot milkers to um, robot feeders to the collars themselves, all of which was powered by 5G, was helping the cows to stay healthy and happy. One of the things we also realized is that the dairy industry is obviously fairly controversial. Um, and we were aware that there was a potential to get some backlash from people who you know, have strong views about uh, dairy farming. Um, so we in, undertook some quite detailed consultations with various industry bodies to really make sure that we got the messaging right. So one of the things that they told us was from research that they had conducted, the, the one of the major objections that people had with dairy farming was this sense that um, the cows had no autonomy and no control over their lives at all. Now, one of the things that um, the 5G tech actually enabled these cows to do is have far greater control than they would on a standard farm, even down to the fact that they they decided when they were milked. They decided how many times a day they were milked um, and the collars basically put a limit on them to protect the health, the safety of the cow. So they couldn't be milked more than four times in a day. So we made sure that um, we really emphasized the welfare of the cows and that level of control they had through all of the messaging that, that we undertook. And actually, we didn't uh, we, we were kind of fully prepared for it. And we had sort of contingency plans in place in case we did get a big backlash. We didn't get any negative commentary about it at all, which was um, which was great. And I think, you know, the testament to the fact that we'd done that that work up front. As I said, we didn't want this to be some, you know, ultimately, I suppose you could argue that um, the the app itself was was a gimmick. It was ultimately designed to be a, a tactic to, to grab attention. But we did want to make it a, a decent app. So we worked with specialists to make sure that we really nailed that usability. We also wanted to make sure we had appropriate controls in it. So as you can probably see from kind of the graphics that have been up on screen, we wanted to make this um, feel very family friendly. Um, and we did anticipate, um, you know, children potentially interacting with the app. Um, we made sure, therefore, that we put appropriate controls in. So things like the in-app messaging and the sending of um, uh, emojis, you could only do that to other people within your herd. So you, you wasn't possible for people to sort of send unsolicited messages to you, um, to strangers. So we would put those kind of appropriate measures and, and controls in. And, you know, probably goes without saying, but, but just for the sake of completeness, we also had a kind of comprehensive comms plan in place to support this, um, you know, Developing an app like this in 12 weeks is um, potentially a little more ambitious than we'd appreciated at the start. And um, I think one of the key learnings um, is allow more time. Um, but, you know, we also made sure that we had built out a really strong plan that covered everything offline, online, all aspects of the marketing mix to ensure that we were going to really launch this with a big bang. So how did it perform? Um, I said at the top that we didn't actually necessarily have huge expectations about how many people were going to use the app. It really was about using that um, as, a, as a foot in the door and creating that moment in time. Uh, we were actually totally wrong on that. So uh, we had 12,500 downloads of the app um, with users in over 10 countries. Um, majority being UK, uh, but second being US. So this attracted huge coverage for us in uh, the US. Um, Cisco being a US based company obviously was delighted about that. And, you know, we've all heard the stats of um, the percentage of apps that get downloaded and never used. So actually, we were really keen to see the actual stats around kind of the usage and video views and stuff like that. And those were also really promising. So we had just shy of eight and a half thousand herds that were created um, and nearly 10,000 views of the video, which Duncan was obviously delighted about. Uh, but we were also really pleased about that because obviously that provided us with that. That was the education piece. That was the piece where we linked back to the project. 
From a digital perspective, um, we saw huge engagement with it um, on social channels. Um, the app included um, a section that explained about the 5G Rural First project um, and links through to the website. And we saw a 52% increase in website traffic to the 5G Rural First site compared to the month before launch, which is a fantastic result. Um, and the media went crazy for it. I absolutely loved cows. Um, we secured six tier one broadcast ops um, to film down on the farm. Um, we achieved 29 unique articles just about um, the cows. And it really worked in terms of how we, how we wanted to, that foot in the door. So you know, these are just the stats for the media coverage for um, the app and the cows. But actually what it really did is then open up this huge discussion and huge interest from the media. Um, we got you know, real um, opportunities then to talk to them and um, were able to then secure coverage on some of the um, the more sort of heavier topics like spectrum sharing that we'd really struggled to pitch in or, or get much interest from before. Suddenly, because we'd grabbed their attention with this, um, they were more receptive to us having some of those more kind of serious discussions and pitches. And it's fair to say the cows took Twitter by storm. So um, people really engaged with this on Twitter. They were sharing their cows. They were boasting about, you know, whose cow was better than, than anybody else's. Um, for those of you who've ever watched the TV program QI, uh, they tweeted about it, which um, was brilliant. And actually seeing some of the puns that people put in the replies to that, that tweet was quite amusing. Um, lots of media um, Twitter coverage as well. Um, and I think for the first time ever, um, we really saw um, that when we were, we put paid money behind this on Twitter as well. And even on those promoted posts, we were seeing people reshare content. We were seeing people comment saying what a great idea it was. Um, I think, you know, frankly, we all know that Twitter isn't always a force for good, but actually, um, Twitter was so positive about that. So we saw kind of huge uh, positive sentiment, excitement, um, and a genuine enjoyment of the fact that, that we'd created this app. Uh, and our girls became world famous. So um, we had BBC Clip down there, we had Farming Today down there, we had Reuters. Um, we, I mentioned that the app did really well in America um, and we got a lot of US coverage. So we were featured on CNN Business, we were featured on CNBC Breakfast, um, we were covered in the New York Times, um, which um, our uh, lords and masters in San Jose on the Cisco side were extremely happy about. Um, my personal favourite was uh, the feature in the Fiji post um, and the video around the cows was uh, the most watched video on the BBC News homepage for over a week. So it really, really did work well in terms of grabbing that attention. And it laid the groundwork for us to subsequently later on in the project get huge amounts of coverage about Orkney and the work that we were doing up there. So once people had heard about the cows, they were then interested to know what else we were doing. Um, and um, it really did kind of open the door in, in that way. Uh, so finally, I wanted to kind of leave you with sort of four key, I suppose, learnings. Um, I don't want to teach anybody to suck eggs. And um, I don't think there's anything in here that's particularly um, shocking or controversial. But I think it's worth pulling these things out because um, for us, this was a really great case study of, of how you can uh, do things differently and be really creative in terms of how you're communicating um, technology and also how you use technology. The first, and, and we will all know this and be familiar with this, you know, break free of that techno bubble. Um, it's so easy to get caught into this, especially um, in my world where you're working with lots of engineers. But, you know, even for those people that are in more traditional B2B marketing worlds and, are, you know, working with product managers and people like that, it's really easy to get kind of seduced and caught up in, in that techno speak. And one of the things we were really adamant on this is that we wanted to break out of that and that to reach that different audience and a broader audience than normal you, you have to change the conversation and do things differently the second is be a magpie so you know with this we were really not constrained by what you normally do in b2b marketing we allowed ourselves to have fun that did mean some fairly interesting pitches from myself to the various people within Cisco <laughs> the farmer down in Somerset and the rest of the the project partners 
Um, but actually, I think what we prove with this is that when you take a risk and when you maybe borrow from the tactics and, and elements that work so well in, in B2C marketing, you can borrow those, you can be a magpie, and pick up those successful things without having to have the huge, huge budgets that they potentially have compared to us. The third is fully commit. If you are going to go in and do something different, really think it through. Make sure that you th you thought through all aspects of this. Um, if you're doing something different like this, you know, I didn't know anything about the dairy industry when I started this. I probably know a lot more about things like cow insemination than I ever possibly expected or wanted to know. But it's about committing to understanding the industry, the sector, the details and bringing in expertise where you don't have that yourself. And the final thing is about being bringing rigor to that creativity. And I think that really kind of fall, follows on from that third point as well, that, you know, actually, it's great to be creative. It's great to do things and be exciting. And we absolutely should be pushing ourselves to do more of that. But actually, I think it's also really important that we think these things through, that we put structure around it, that it's ultimately dials up to a strategy um, that will also help with the pitching of something that's a bit off the wall as well if you can actually prove that these things have been well thought through. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour um, of uh, me and Moo and uh, my journey last year with a bunch of cows in Somerset. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen now so that I can hopefully return back and see if it's going to think about this. Hi, Vicky. Come back. I can see you all. There we go. Right, I can see you all again now. Hiya. Um, thank you very much for that. I, I love this campaign. It just it doesn't make me smile. <laughs> and I'm really and I really am enjoying that people are uh, enjoying the humour of it as well. So, so <laughs> the, you, you can tell you have fun with it in terms of just how it, how it comes across. So that that's really yeah. good. And and I think marketing, some of the you know marketing should be fun. B two B marketing particularly should be fun. And so something like this just lifts everyone's spirits and, and, and is, is really exciting. So so thank you for coming and sharing it with us. My pleasure. If you do have questions, if you've got a few more minutes, I've got a few questions to ask her, but please do don't miss out on the chance to talk about this. I think it's an interesting campaign because actually, um, you know, it's this is this is kind of falling into our in-tech stream. So it's about marketing of technology, but actually it's also about and you're not using traditional martech. It's not you haven't focused here on using marketing automation or CRM or something. No. But you're using technology, and actually, in some ways, this is the kind of the intersection of, um, of, of of technology in terms of the app and also and PR. You know, so it's quite it's, it's quite an exciting th thing. Um, uh, I mean, what I, you talked about what you what you learned from this, but um, I mean, you didn't set out to create, as you said, you know, you know more about cow insemination than you might ever have wanted to know. Yeah, <laughs> great deal that you'd want to know about that if you were a farmer. Um, no, well, you didn't set out to do this, did you? You set out to, to do something completely different. So it was very much a serendipitous kind of a route that you got that got you here. Yeah, I th I think so, and I think you know one of the things that um, is great about my job and the work that I do is that um, by my very definition of it, I'm always working with things that have never been done before, and actually I always try and bring that into what we're doing from a marketing perspective as well. And yeah, absolutely. At the, at the beginning of working in this project, there was no part of me that thought what I need to do is create a, a create an app for cows. Um, but when we were reviewing, and I think this is about being led by by the project and being and being led by you know there was huge amounts of passion and enthusiasm in in that project through all aspects of it. Um, and, you know, working with, uh, I mean, I've, I've mercilessly, mercilessly ribbed at Duncan at the farm over the last half an hour, but he was fantastic and he's so passionate about his cows. And I think that's the thing. It's about identifying the, the opportunities to have some fun, but also working with people that are so passionate and can bring that passion to life that I think um, really helps to you to, to think about things in a slight, slightly different way. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. Did we anticipate building an app no am I ever likely to build an app for cows again probably not um, but it was a it was a great experience and it is a great example of I think not limiting yourself in terms of you know this is the standard way that we that we market a, an innovation project I mean, you were in a new situation because there was quite a, a broad brief wasn't there you know and you didn't you, said, yeah. you didn't have any really hard sales objectives for example for kind of absolutely yeah 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 and I mean and that and that that certainly does 
um, make my life um, a, a little easier than um, I suppose probably people with more traditional B2B roles. I think one of the things that makes my work a little more challenging is that our audiences aren't always that well defined um, and where they are they're often many and extremely varied so on the one hand we had well we want to influence Ofcom they know lots about things like spectrum sharing and we want to um, you know communicate to Joe blogs on the street who probably knows nothing about it probably doesn't care or wants to know anything about it so um, I think one of the challenges that you have is when you have so so broad a brief is about choosing where you're going to focus your attention because actually what you can't do and these projects are typically time bound so you, you've got fairly aggressive time time scans is is deliver something like this for every single one of your audiences because you could have up to 10 different audiences in there and they're not as well established and um, uh, kind of considered we, it's not sort of a traditional you know these are our b2b markets these are our audiences these are our audience personas so um yeah in, in one way is easier in other ways i think slightly more challenging but um yeah probably all balances out in the end i guess would it have worked without the um kind of national news coverage because if you've got and i expect that farming today are probably going to cover it you know this is really not you yeah. know um yeah but BBC obviously is obviously a different kettle of fish. If you just got that kind of tech press and farming press, and you know, would it would it have would it have been a, been deemed a success? Do you think? I think it. I think it would have been, but I don't think it would have been as unbridled a success. And I think one of the things that. Um, so the first innovation project that I ever worked on for Cisco was a, a smart city demonstrator based up in Manchester. <clears throat> And um, the uh, Amir director of innovation within Cisco, the, we had lots of press coverage. The piece of coverage that he was most excited at, and we actually got lots and lots of, of coverage in this, in this publication, was the Manchester Evening News. And I remember saying to him, like, the Manchester Evening News, like, I don't understand why you're so excited about this. And he was saying, well, but that's, that's the sort of press that Cisco will never be in. You know, Computer Weekly absolutely like you know it, it, like you say the farming today there are some press that you know you're going to get and that actually it's just completely relevant but again you're in that whole communicating in the echo chamber you're telling people that are already interested and actually i think the the real reason that this campaign was such a success is because we did break out of that because we suddenly did get cisco and the project as a whole into places like the new york times which is not an everyday occurrence we later got um coverage in the economist and again that's something that from a cisco perspective um is not an everyday occurrence so even with those big multinational corporates they it was getting them into a completely different place and reaching a different audience from where they'd done before so i think that that doing things differently and, and reaching different audiences was, was a real key element of why this was deemed to be such a success okay and you talked earlier on about working with technology people i mean most you know if you talk about in the context of most of what people are wrestling with out there in the context of this event it's around actually how you deploy marketing automation how you get the best out of sales, yeah. sales force uh, sales uh, crm other crm solutions available um <laughs> uh, and all these other hey plugins other bits and pieces you were work, actually working with the development team to build something from scratch so it's a very different kind of tech to yeah. and you talked about sort of personalities and the people involved in that would you work with them again or or, or is it such a i mean regarding <laughs> what you say but but I imagine it was a cultural learning curve. Um, it, uh, yes, but that is the nature of the work that I do. So um, that's true for everything that I, you know, the reason I, the reason I went set out to, to build Innovate Comms as, as an organisation is because there was this realisation that the world of innovation projects, there's so many of them that happen all over the place. They're full of engineers and very successful and effective pr project and program managers, but they don't have people like you and you and I in them. Um, and that, to me, I think is significantly limits the impact that they can have in the real world. So, um, yeah, I, I constantly find myself speaking a different language from the rest of the people I interact with. Um, but actually, I think, um, you know, sometimes that can be frustrating, undeniably. Uh, but actually, I think it's quite good for us. And I think it also... Um, it challenges you and it challenges you in terms of making you work that little bit harder to to pitch things in but i think the other way it challenges you is in 
how you measure success like it's really easy to get caught up in a oh well you know we achieved this many engagements and impressions on twitter and you know i speak to people on daily basis and they're like i don't understand what an impression is i don't know what an engagement is i don't know what you're talking about um and at the point where you have to take a step back and really kind of articulate those things it makes you really kind of question okay how valuable actually is that and are those the best metrics so yes it can be frustrating sometimes but actually i think it's really healthy to have that challenge because it really forces you to think about things without your kind of marketing hat on yeah absolutely um uh, so so and you've 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 kind of um as well as you work for cisco you've set up a separate organization um, yeah how can marketers be more innovative what do we need to do i mean i think i guess i do feel the sense that if you come from a pr background and your job is to make waves it's some, some there's less you're less anchored to something it's kind of sometimes easier to do but as a general sense is that what, what can marketers do to be more innovative? we all want to be innovative we feel i feel like marketers feel that like you should be innovative how can we do it better yeah, and I think that's interesting what you say about kind of the PR piece, because actually my background had always been marketing, hadn't been PR at all. And I've only really kind of taken on that as we've done these innovation, um, I've entered this innovation world and had the opportunity to, you know, achieve that holy grail of an integrated uh, commerce approach. Um, and I think it's, I think you're right, it's something we all talk about. It's something that I think it's, it's about pushing yourself and it's also about being I think it's largely about being brave. It's about being brave enough to 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 test new things. It's being brave enough to to think differently, brave enough to pitch differently. So recognise that actually, if you want to do something differently, you are going to need to go through many 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 types of internal pitches to be able to to, to get that right. Um, and you know that requires hard work. Um, but actually it pays off. And I think the other thing as well is to be really clear and to give yourself permission to fail. So yeah, I'm talking to you today because me and Matt, me and Moo was a, a huge success. Um, if it hadn't been a huge success, you probably wouldn't have invited me to talk about it, but I still would have learned a huge amount of stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's the thing. And you know, for me working in the innovation space generally, um, it's such a different mindset that it is actually okay to fail. And I think when you are in a more traditional marketing role and you've, you're supporting sales targets and you know your your metrics and you've got sales directors breathing down your neck, that is more difficult. Um, but I think it is possible if you take the your ultimately your stakeholders and so sales director or whoever on the journey with you. Um, I think everybody wants to do something different, um, but it's about being brave enough to do it. And I suppose for those of you that are in kind of I suppose more metric environments, I guess it's about not putting all of your eggs in the uh, brave basket and maybe ring fencing a piece off to look at testing there so that if it does fail spectacularly the impact isn't too severe yeah, I, I think i think that's fantastic advice i, I, I just one thought one to leave with is that um i went to an event a few years back now which was and it, it had speak, people speaking from it was a it was people speaking from a couple of well-known consumer campaigns one was the cabaret's gorilla and one was compared mm -hmm. both of those things came out completely by accident Right. Yeah. It's very easy for us to sit in B2B and go, oh, gosh, these wonderfully creative, crazy things consumer marketers do. And, and that just shows that two of the things which have been most iconic over the last 10, 15 years, are exactly like your thing, came out by accident and came by certainty. Yeah. And someone having the courage of their convictions to make it work and the backing then to, then to carry it to carry it forward. So yeah. um, I think it's a it's a this is a fantastic example of something which is which has been taken through and, and followed. And I think we all need to embrace our inner, inner level of innovation. So. Vicky, thank you so much for coming and speaking. My today. pleasure. Um, it's great to hear from you. It's a fantastic case today. Lovely, we've got some really nice comments at the sides. Thank you for those. Um, yeah, thank and you. hope we can get you back again to speak very soon. Thanks a lot. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Joel. Thanks for your time, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.